we met on a trip to China. Her name was Marietta Sackler. We had a lot in common. She was a psychoanalyst too, educated in New York. And uh, we spent many years together. And when we could be together, we were. And when we couldn't, we talked on the phone every Sunday for 40 years. <laughs> I was uh, with a group of Chinese scholars. I was not a Chinese scholar myself, of course. But I was a physician, and so they took me in. It was called a People to People's Conference. And it was just at the time of the recognition of Nixon, Schlesinger's recognition of China. It was quite an amazing time to be there. And they finally settled out. We were there as artists and art lovers. The last year or two was very painful because she became demented. I don't know if she really recognized me. But she sent this poem, this little verse. I left my heart in San Francisco. It's being taken care of by a very dear friend there. Love, Marietta. And it, was the, it was very moving to me. That's a picture. <laughs> uh, great, yeah. In her book she wrote, Well, why didn't we ever marry? And she said we were too different. Which is true. I'm sort of a not that well organized, <laughs> and uh, she found that endearing and liked, it, but at a distance. <laughs> she, as you could imagine, to running a, a big company. <laughs> what would she have to do with me? You know. <laughs> But we st stayed apart to a certain degree, but we were very close in another way, and that's worked for 40 years. Well, I wanted to uh, be part of that bigger world. I, besides reading Freud and Marx, I was reading Proust, and that sort of, I felt very much like Swan. <laughs> <laughs> if you can believe that. <laughs> I felt like this outsider who was partly insider, you know, in a very different world. She lived in a very different world, as you can imagine. I grew up in this little town of Fresno. It was about that little. It was about 50,000 people. And it was a rather mixture of different types of people, as I mentioned to you. There's a lot of Armenians and settled in Fresno after the terrible massacre in Armenia. And uh, people from Mexico and actually from India, East India, there China, Japan. There was quite a mixture of people, but there was a very solid white American Protestant WASP community that ran the town and was really central. And I, I wanted very much, I was very much an outsider in that group, but I wanted and struggled very hard to be part of it and more or less succeeded. Interestingly enough, there was a cell of Trotskyites in Fresno. And this was in the 30s. And it was when the Dust Bowl and all the Dust Bowl people from Arkansas who came to Fresno and became just laborers, worked for a dollar a day, the whole family in the fields, and it was disgusting and terrible, and they were exploited and underpaid. We would have these meetings every Friday night, and I was about 14 at that time. But they let me join because I was reading Marx, and uh, I knew one of the young ladies, there was a group of Sicilian atheist communists who settled in Fresno. <laughs> and their name was, they were Pedrincelli was their name. We would secretly meet at their house Friday nights. My mother kind of knew of my politics, but my stepfather, he was a solid Republican, he didn't. Interesting enough, one of the ministers, a congregational minister, was, and his sons were part of this group. They, the sons had all gone to Spain and fought in the Spanish Civil War. There was about three or four of these people 
who had fought in the Civil War, had been injured and came back to Fresno. The Pedrincelli sisters and, and, and myself, I looked at them as our heroes. This lady from, who's known as Red Rosa, or Rosa the Red, I forget, she was a very beautiful, buxom lady, came from New York. She was on a circuit. The Ipsos had a circuit in which they'd go from city to city. Some of our people who were in our group did that too. And Rosa really was well known because she had been tied up to a lamppost by the police in New York and beaten. And so she was well, besides being a beautiful buxom lady, she was also a kind of a hero to us. She learned my stepfather was shipper of grapes, rather well to do. And uh, was exploiting all the workers, and I agreed with her. Oh, she's <laughs> so I could have joined you and Eugene. Eugene McCrary was one of the Irish flaming red-haired guys who was on the circuit. So we went out and picked it at this big farm. Fortunately, nothing terrible happened that day. At the next day, they went out, and I had to be in school. And fortunately, McCrary was beaten up, and Rosie was, and she got out of the vineyard, I mean, the cotton fields it was, actually, flatly. And at that point, I decided that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I dropped my association with the Ipsos and uh, returned to Freud. There was a young fellow, in Fresno who was at Stanford Medical School and he told me all about it and he said, it's a good place and you'll, you'll do well there. So I decided I had to get really good grades and I became a hard worker and got into Stanford in medical school there. To romanticize myself, I'd say the second chapter is where I met Sarah Stein, who was a Stein family member, Gertrude and Leos. Yeah, and uh, I was just a kid, and she was in her 70s. She had just lost her husband, and uh, her, most of her family were still in Europe. They came over with this extraordinary collection of Matisse, Picasso, and Cezanne. I got, we became very close friends and had been a therapist it was sort of in France and in San Francisco. And I learned a lot from her. I, we discussed our cases together. <laughs> I was very taken with the, that movement in f Paris, you know, in those days. I read all those people and was very interested in the artists and writers at that time. And she knew all those people, so we had a... That relationship lasted for many years until her death also. The Army changed everything for me. I was the director of neurology and psychiatry for the Ryukas Command. And I was a, the head psychiatrist for a lot of areas and I was sent around to various places in that part of the world. They sent me to Okinawa. It turned out to be a beautiful place and wonderful people, and it was a big change in my life where I met a lot of these painters purely by accident. I was driving it in the back fields of, that were off limits to Americans. I discovered this group called uh, the Okina they call themselves the Okinawa, Okinawa Artists Society. And they'd lost all their public. Nobody could buy pictures or was very interested. It was people were just interested in surviving. They barely had enough food to go around. We befriended them and took uh, painting lessons and paid them for those. And they did a picture of me. I asked them to do a portrait. And in those days, we paid by cartons of cigarettes. That was the currency of the time. I helped them quite a bit. I brought things over. I had people send things over from the States and also got people on the island interested in buying their work. So they had an audience again.
they became kind of uh, looked down upon by his later Okinawans and uh, as being sort of slightly traitors, you know, working with Americans. The last time I was there was the State Department arranged it, actually, because they were trying to cement Okinawan-American relationship. And it was a rediscovery of these artists. Out of that came a book, actually, in Japan called uh, Under the Sun and Stars. It's written by a woman named Maha Harada, who is a rather well-known, popular Jap Japanese author. And she wrote a book about me and what I did there. This is the book. Is that you? Is that the portrait That's of you? me, yeah. Jesus, you handsome devil. I became sort of, strangely enough, a, a hero. <laughs> she made me a hero. I was hardly that, but she made me a hero. And it was a play in Tokyo this last year on that. They made a play, an earlier one, for, not from this book, Under the Sun and Stars, but in Okinawa, and they sent me a little disc of it. And in it, in it I beat up some terrible American toughs. <laughs> <laughs> Very unlike me <laughs> to beat up anybody. <laughs>